Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, gentlemen, for your testimony. Um, and Mr. Cooper, I do want to follow up, and you said provide an alternative, an alternative to just random numbers. Uh, it would be to set strategic objectives in these theaters, identify what we're trying to do, and then figure out what we need to get the mission done, and then that ends up being the number. I mean, it's, this is, you know, to have a number be the driver or causing all the things that are in the discussion and the testimony today. I led a CODEL uh, back to Afghanistan, been there myself in uniform, of course, uh, uh, but last uh, in May. And uh, deep concern seeing what we're talking about here firsthand uh, with uh, also commanders and others spending a tremendous amount of time to find workarounds and measure the jerry-rigging uh, in order to comply. Uh, so the, these real concerns are there and they're taking the time of the commanders to not do the mission but to actually comply with these random numbers. Uh, I think the first question I would have is what is the purpose of the CAPS? What's the purpose of the numbers, uh, the limits on boots on the ground? Is it cost? Is it risk to Americans? Um, because in, in these cases, the cost we're seeing is probably higher, um, as, we're, uh, as was discussed already today. A risk to an American contractor is similar to a risk to an American troop. So uh, it's not even clear what is the objective of these particular uh, force uh, management limits right now in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, because it seems like we're not achieving e either of them, if it's risk or if it's cost. Uh, and I think about, um, you know, I remember back when I was at Bagram with my A-10 squadron on Christmas Eve, uh, out on the flight line with my maintenance troops, trying to get an engine fix that had been problematic and had some, an emergency. Uh, it, on Christmas night, in the middle of the cold and the snow, trying to get this done and everybody doing everything they can to keep the mission going around the clock. Uh, those were my maintenance guys uh, that reported to me. And one thing with the contractors is they don't report to the commander. They report to some program manager. And if you want to have to get them to do something differently, you, you can't direct them to do that. Uh, so what, what, what hasn't, first of all, the question is about what's, what do you think the purpose is of the CAPS? Because I think we're not achieving any of the purposes, potentially. And then secondly, what's the impact on unity of command, chain of command? Uh, because if you've got contractors out there, it's just a different relationship than if they're your unit. General Ham first. No, I'll, I'll take, a, again, a first attempt at that, if, if I may. I, I think there are valid purposes for force management levels. I think it does ensure that the application of U.S. Armed Forces is consistent with the policy decisions that are made by the Commander-in-Chief, by the Secretary of Defense, uh, and within the, the resource constraints that, are, that have been approved by the Congress. So I think there are appropriate, uh, there's an appropriate role for force management levels. From a purely military standpoint, I think it is one way uh, to manage the global force and, and, and the requirements that, that the, the Department of Defense needs to meet uh, around the globe. Uh, it does have a tendency, it, it does constrain uh, uh, unanticipated growth, so-called mission creep, uh, from occurring without appropriate approval and authority. So I think there is a proper role for, for that. But I think you're exactly right, ma'am, to say uh, when, the, when activities are driven by a number rather than by the mission, right. then, then I think we have got things uh, out, of, out of whack and out of priority. So again, back to my earlier statement, I think it is, it is when is the force management level decided upon in the planning and decision-making process, and what's the, the appropriate mechanism for revisiting that mm -hmm. as conditions change? Right, and then comments on the chain of command, or General Dupic, do you want to yeah, talk about I'll, that? I'll uh, first reiterate that I've been under force management levels uh, three times, uh, first in Haiti, second in Bosnia, third in Iraq, uh, and at each of those times, in, in my opinion, the force management levels were set correctly by the strategic objective, uh, not as high as the military commanders wanted, but not as low as, uh, as they are now. So there is a role for these things. In terms of contractors, I, I, I have to report that I've only had good experiences with those contractors that had worked uh, for me. And, oh, they're great people, don't yeah. get me wrong. I mean, and, I've worked alongside and, tremendous contractors as and well. And in terms of responsiveness, uh, I've had bad experiences, though, with respect to flexibility, mm -hmm. because uh, when you change the, the task, you have to change the contract, and that is a very timely uh, uh, affair. Uh, for example, we tra had to change the contract for uh, police development in Iraq in 2008. It took eight months. I initiated it. I left. Mm -hmm. My successor inherited. And in that intervening eight months, the, we had the mismatch of skill sets and personnel to do the job that was required. 
Got it. Uh, just final comment on the TDY element. When I was there in the spring, uh, we had entire units TDY to Helmand Province uh, to help stop the bleeding there. You don't go TDY to Helmand Province. You go TDY to Nellis Air Force Base. Uh, to be calling TDY to a combat zone to be out there uh, addressing the combat situation is ridiculous. And that's what these random uh, force management levels have uh, you know, have created. Uh, that I mean, that's just insane. Uh, and I would just say, I know I'm out of my time, Mr. Russell, if we are if there is any study of the exact costs, uh, I'd ask that it would uh, consider also the cost of stationing air assets outside Iraq and Afghanistan, like combat search and rescue, ISR, tactical airlift that are now in the theater, but further away. Uh, both the financial costs uh, with fuel and the other assets, and then the risks. If you don't have Seesaw right there, you're talking about risk to lives because you're not as responsive. And these things need to be included in any discussion as well. Thank you, Madam Chair, I appreciate it. You bet.